Hi, I'm Craig, and I'm the co-host of the MQ Open Mind podcast. On behalf of my co-host, Professor Rory O'Connor, and myself, thank you so much for watching the first half of season two. We hope you were able to gain a further insight into the world of mental health research, whilst understanding a little bit more about yourself and those around you. For this special episode of Open Mind, and in honor of Research Appreciation Day, here are the questions that our guests would love to be answered by mental health research. Open Mind will return in the autumn, and we hope to see you again for more lived experience stories and more mental health research. Season two began with Dr. Anne Duffy, professor of psychiatry at Queen's University, Kingston, where we discussed understanding bipolar disorder, supporting students' mental health, and whether mental illnesses can be genetic. If you're 10 million pound, more than your 10 million Canadian dollars, what, what would you say, what would you want to prioritize in terms of mental health research? Well, I, gu I guess in terms of um, mental health research is really big. So I guess in terms of the high risk study, I think what's really key for psychiatry is we, we really have a stumbling block with these very broad diagnostic categories. It's really hard to figure out what, what the mechanisms are, what the pathophysiology is of cancer you know, you have to drill down into specific subtypes. And we really need to start really researching um, very narrowly defined phenotypes of illnesses and really understand what the genetic underpinnings of those illnesses are so that we can actually then understand what's happening and, you know, develop tests for do you have bipolar disorder or do and, and also develop specific treatments. So I, I think psychiatry is really stuck because we haven't moved along in our diagnostic constructs and that's really been hampering us. In terms of student mental health research, I think we're on the right track. You know, I think we need to understand from the students who are increasingly looking more like the general population of young people, what's going on? How come anxiety and depressive symptoms are increasing both in university students and in the general population of young people? What's contributing to that using rigorous research methods and theoretical models and then developing, you know, student tailored interventions, but we need partners at the table and you know, as I say, you know, different universities differ on this. We, all universities agree that this is in, in, in a priority, but how to go about it, it it's, um, it's interesting because I'm doing a paper with a historian from Swansea um, and uh, Sarah Crooks, and we're becoming increasingly aware that the same arguments and the same conversations happened in 1960 as are happening now. And so why can't we get past that? <laughs> So it's looking at translating, we can develop findings, then how do we translate that in an efficient, effective way? And, and we need student advocacy for this too. So we're, we're continuing to partner with students, you know, not for us, without us kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Two brilliant, brilliant answers. Well, in March, we spoke to Associate Professor in Psychology at Durham University, Dr. Ben Alderson Day, where he explained the idea of presence the research behind hallucinations and the fourth man phenomenon. But if somebody said to you, what are you, what are the key was the key priority we should be focusing on in terms of mental health research, what would you suggest? What would you would like to see us focusing on as a community? As a community, gosh, well that is a it's a real million dollar question, isn't it? Um I think from a from a basic science perspective, there's still fundamentally this question of, you know, what what is psychosis? Not from a definitional level, but for, you know, why would our minds have this sort of response or reaction in the in the direction of the senses or our beliefs that would lead to these extreme states? Because psychosis is something that happens all around us, um, you know, through many, many different conditions as well can lead to those states of like losing grip of reality. But I think um, uh, in terms of to step away from the basic science, really the kind of the focus for research also needs to be on how can we take into account a plurality of ideas and interpretations about these experiences how can we draw upon the power of lived experience in an equitable way to really enhance our understanding of that phenomena and i think we still have in large part uh, a system of research and of commissioning and of treatment development which is still fairly top down um and isn't isn't great at harnessing that that kind of wisdom and that and that power mm. Um, so I think I think that's the big challenge. Um, so I'm aware that I've given you two two answers there, well, <laughs> basic good, science and, a, and more of a really a policy answer. But I think uh, you know I think that's where the field's gonna gonna need to go uh, mm -hmm. really. And there yeah. are some steps towards it, but it's it's hard to do. Um, so yeah. No, great, great. 
In the spirit of mental resilience, we spoke to endurance athlete and motivational speaker James Gwinnett to discuss recovering from addiction and using sport to improve your mental health. If you had all the money in the world, or somebody said, "Here's a big a problem to fix," and we'll give you whatever money is required. What would you What would, would you think is number one, or what would you like us to address as men, as a mental health research community? I would like to know why the mind is so negative. And I say that from the point of view of doing endurance challenges, but it could be it could be anything from meeting a deadline to learning to drive your car. It could be anything. For some reason, there is there is something in our brains that tells us, no, oh, no, you can't do that. Don't bother. Go and, you know, sack it off. Go and have a drink. No, don't worry about that one. Come back to it tomorrow. I need to think about that. That's a, that's a good, interesting question. I'm trying to think, is the brain by default negative? Because I would argue that it's, well, it's, there's huge individual, individual differences. And if you think about negative affect versus positive affect. So some of us are more, more habitually we're likely to respond if something if a neutral event happens or some of us are more likely to interpret it as negative versus positive and then you can get into this vicious cycle so i'll have to think about whether on balance the evidence is that the brain is negative but that's that's a, that's a really interesting question actually so whether it is or not is interesting yeah i mean it happens every time i go for a run without fail and, and that is not an exaggeration yeah, every yeah, time yeah. i go for a run i'll get two kilometers in and my brain will go oh why don't you just why don't you just yeah no, we've all had that call it a day yeah. and head home yeah the, the sofa's really comfy and there's a bottle of water in the fridge you just go and rehydrate go and feel better go and have a go and have a slice of cake and then i think well that's ridiculous i'm only two kilometers in and yeah. i have, i have to override that in order to keep pushing through and then that i mean that will happen a hundred times on an ultra marathon what's this going to say you know why does my brain do it and yeah, that's, that's yeah, the question. Yeah. Why? And every time I have to override it. And I think, no, no, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, the next <laughs> I'm going to make the next kilometre. I'm going to get to the next checkpoint. I'm going to have a energy gel, whatever it is. That negativity is, I just, I don't know where it comes from. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, well, that, when I'm out, I just focus on the next lamppost. Exactly. Yeah, get it's the, lamp the next milestone. Yeah. And, 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 and it comes, yeah. ultra, ultra running is, uh, as is life is all about mental fitness. It's all about putting one foot in front of the other, whether it's literal or metaphorical. Yep. Come through a difficult period in your life. If you can put, just keep going, just keep going, it yep. will come to an end. Same with you know, the, the literal running thing. I think it was Winston Churchill that said, if you're going through hell, just keep going. That, you know, it's that kind of mentality. Yeah, uh, get to it. yeah. That, that, well, yeah. That we that we all need, and and quite why the brain tries to convince us otherwise is there. You go. There's your there's your research. There's your. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Also, good good question indeed. To discuss young people's mental health, we spoke to academic psychologist and author Dr. Lucy Fox, who also explained the importance of finding appropriate treatment for your needs, and her book, What Mental Illness Really Is, and What It Isn't. So we give you a million quid, right? If MQ give you a million quid, what's the one question you wish you would you would try to address for that million quid? So, I mean, there's one thing that I'm doing at the moment, which is trying to, um, but I already have funding for this, is to try and understand um, whether school mental health interventions cause harm. So there's this sort of, I'm sure you're aware of it, but some new studies that have come out showing that some teenagers are worse off having these, especially these kind of whole group you know, universal interventions, worse off having them than not having them in terms of um, it leading to an increase in reporting of mental health problems. So that's one thing that I'm very interested in. Even, you know, even if it's for a minority of teenagers, that can scale up across the country. So we really need to understand whether teaching teenagers about mental health actually leads some of them to report or experience more of these problems. Uh, so that's one strand that I'm really interested in and already doing. But the, this, this, the what I would do if if I had a million pounds of research money would be to start trying to experimentally demonstrate whether the way you talk to people about mental health can actually affect, you know, in the lab, how they report and how they experience certain symptoms. Uh, so then there's tiny pockets of people trying to do this already being shown with physical health symptoms, you know, depending on the information yeah. that you give people, you can, you can experimentally induce more or less uh, reporting of these symptoms. So I'm very interested in, um, yeah, starting a strand of work that tries to look at that. Because if you if you can show in a sort of contained lab environment that the way you talk to people um, can lead to an increase in how they report their um, mental health problems, then that's a little piece of evidence to say maybe this is happening on a on a sort of societal scale.
No, absolutely not. Two fascinating topics and, and related. As the theme for this year's Mental Health Awareness Week was anxiety, we spoke to mental health activist and author Dean Stott about supporting people with anxiety, the difference between anxiety and anxiety disorders, and the benefits of using social media for your mental health. But think about the so one of the things we always ask, we're always keen to sort of explore in this in our podcast is get different people's views on uh, what we should be doing in terms of research in the field. And so with your vast experience, perhaps not as a researcher, but obviously as this educator, communicator, um, reaching so many people. And if we were saying, right, here's a couple of million pounds, mm -hmm. what would you think the research community, what would you say our prior, your priority would be for our priorities for research and anxiety? Just to develop more techniques for people to use, to develop more strategies, to look into reasons why, for example, SSRIs work for some people but mm -hmm. don't work for others, to to really pour the money into research that's not that, that's funded by the right people. So it's not if you're looking at medication, it's not funded by the pharmaceuticals, for example for non-biased uh, research into the best techniques and tools that we can use to help as many people as possible. And I'm also a international ambassador for a, uh, for a bullying um, yeah, that. charity that. over yeah. in America. And that's something that's really cool to my heart because psychoeducation, CBT tools, all that can be learned at an early age. And we're just not doing enough to teach children Firstly, about anxiety, and secondly, how to manage it, what techniques and tips we can do. And it's a passion of mine to get that into schools um, as early as possible. So, yeah, I would use the research to get it to the kids and get them educated. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, I think. Especially no matter what way we look at the evidence, though, it's very clear that the mental health of young people has, I mean, has deteriorated. It's got worse, certainly, over recent years. And, and I think the more we can do earlier, I think you're absolutely right, is the better. And that, um, and I think we are moving in the right direction, but uh, but I think there's still a long way to go. And, and especially given we know that, depending which statistic you look at, the majority of mental health problems happens before you're 20, or your early 20s, and often, obviously, in your teens. So it is really, really important that we, we can do more there. In June, we spoke to occupational therapist Jenny Okolo to discuss empathy in the criminal justice sector, understanding neurodiversity, and ensuring well-being in the workplace. So if we were able to give you all the money in the world, right, well, <laughs> what, what would be your priorities, do you think? What sort of research questions do you think we should be addressing? Perhaps looking at, you know, like I mentioned before, the, the root causes. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm also quite passionate about... Um, you know, going into schools, I've worked with PRUs, so pupil referral units as well, you know, where, you know, challenging behaviour young people tend to go to. And actually, yeah, getting to the roots of, you know, why certain conditions, especially even neurodevelopmental conditions as well, which is also an area that I touched in my talk, um, that often not identified at earlier stages and perhaps maybe misconstrued as challenging behaviours where actually it could be they could be autistic or have ADHD or something like that mm -hmm. um so that's the main that's one and then also bridging the gap between the services and the community especially when it comes to accessing people of different cultural backgrounds because especially working in prisons I found um and again there are stats to, to back this up where a high proportion of black men um tend to be the ones in prisons um and even um section under the mental health act as well so speaking to families and just people in the community of various different backgrounds to educate them about mental health, provide them with the language, especially when it comes to seeking help as well. So I think a lot of research, I, I would want a lot of research to be um, had into that. Um, and also, I think that would definitely um, support even us as health workers when we are working with families and individuals who have a very different understanding of what mental health is or might not know what mental health is to just get them. Yeah, get them to have the right language to be able to access that support. Um, and then also, like I said, in schools as well, which is I think that's where it usually begins in yeah. terms of identifying this. Yeah, no, great suggestions. I mean, because trying to use that basic science and really to inform all aspects of sort of treatment, care, early intervention and so on. 